A few weeks ago, Oz Armour mechanic Steve was able to determine that the problems our Leopard was having were electrical. Now, new Leopard parts are prohibitively expensive, and it looked like our repairs were going to grind to a halt until a very generous fan came to our rescue. Hi, I'm Kurt from Oz Armour, and welcome to Workshop Wednesday. A kind viewer of ours from the States has, uh, after watching the last episode on me struggling with the wiring for the Leopard, he had some spare bits and pieces and also, I think, some tooling for doing the connectors, so he's kindly uh, posted it to us, and it just turned up just 10 minutes ago. I've been through the Oz Armour security security screening process, so yeah. No pl bombs? Please don't send us explosives. Or underpants. <laughs> or underpants. So yeah, special special thanks to Chuck because at the time that he was actually digging the stuff out, he had to go down the back of his house to the shed and it was three foot under snow or something or other. So that's oh, real. You're joking. That's real dedication. So here we go, we've got USB drive with videos, how to operate the tools. I always like videos. I think I learn the most from videos. Now this, this is probably the, uh, the single most important thing of, that he sent, and this is the actual tool used for crimping the contacts that go into these mil spec um, connectors. Super generous of Chuck to, to send it to us. Wow. And quick, quick way it works, I've got I've got a terminal from a, a, another series of, of mil spec connectors, but you set the type of size of wire that you're going to crimp, you set the, the type of crimp connector, the pin goes into the tool, and when you push it together, can you see the four little jaws going out? What it does is that it stops at a specially calibrated size, which exactly crimps the end of the terminal holding the wire in. And this is super important because if it's not right, you either break the connector or the wire falls out and, and you're in, in trouble. So he also said that he had a lot of uh, second-hand used terminals and pins, so. Oh, you're kidding. He was gonna send this to us as well too, so I'm guessing that's what it is. I can hear terminals in a, in a plastic <laughs> bag. And what Chuck's done is he's included a bunch of uh, connectors so this is the bulkhead type connector that I think we can make use for the uh, for the solenoid octopus that goes inside the transmission and he's also included um, a couple of the uh, female connectors which will help us repair that long one as well too so uh, and most importantly a bunch of pins these are the pin insertion and removal tools so the, the special shape is so that you can stick the tool into the connector and it releases the locks on the pin so that you can withdraw the pin. Getting information, knowledge, like you see what I get up to, I'm sort of working on all sorts of different things and about a million things at once. So being able to uh, have the time to focus to, to learn on something, a shortcut like this is, is invaluable. As you can see, this connector has completely fried. New cables of this type for a leopard tank are currently running at several thousand euros at the moment due to the present demand. So the combination of Steve learning how to rewire this old one and Chuck's assistance in sending out these tools and components has been extremely helpful. What I'm trying to do here is to just carefully pull back the, the, the rubber outer sheath so that there's enough length to be able to disassemble the connector but I don't want to pull on it too hard because then you can break or damage the wires. Yeah, this is a clamp that you use for clamping hydraulic lines and, and other pipes. So it's made so it sort of clamps without cutting. Now we're getting close to the to the actual connector itself. I'm probably going to have to start to sort of chop it up a bit to get it to get it to come out because it's in pretty poor condition and we're not going to be reusing the connector anyway. I think this is like a neoprene seal or something that the cables run through into the back of the connector to try and waterproof it. Okay. 
back. After a bit of wrangling, Steve was able to start pulling out the wires from the connector. Is it going to make it? I'll just pull them out one by one. Notice the difference in lengths of the various wires. This is to account for the elbow in the connector. For the new pins to be crimped on, the old ones have to be trimmed off and the crimping tool calibrated. The new pin is slotted over the cut wire and placed in the tool crimped and presto, job done. The way it crimps like this, it crimps so well that in theory you can put this pin in the vise, pull on it, and you should be able to break the wire before the, the wire will actually come out of the crimp. 18 squeezes later and the cable loom is finished, but Steve has to test that everything has gone to plan. Start with terminal V which is in the centre and then work in a spiral pattern back outwards, so that's the easiest way to put the pins in, and it's just a mirror both, both ends are a mirror of each other, so terminal B is in the same spot as terminal B on both sides. Okay. I've got perfect continuity, so it's also doing an electrical check to make sure that I've made a good connection here and also through the wire. So we're sort of killing a few birds with one stone when we do this. Terminal B on the connector. There is a tool that you can use to, to insert the pins, but I can feel this has gone in nice and positive. And I can see here that the pin has gone all the way through and it's in and it's, it's solid. So one down, 18 to go. About half an hour later, all done. So we've got the fi finished, finished product. So I've just put a, a sleeve over the outside of it to assist with keeping moisture and stuff out. But repin the connector. Been able to reuse part of the original 90 degree. And I've done a full electrical check to make sure that we've got good continuity between one end and the other. So now it's time to uh, thread the needle and stick the octopus of wires back in the transmission. And then we'll do a full sort of plugs in test of the system and make sure that it's working properly. Despite leopard parts being hard to get out of Europe at the moment, we were very lucky to pick up a couple of engines locally here in Australia. They're going to prove invaluable in keeping our own leopard series vehicles running and could even end up in future restoration projects. But who knows? So this is the uh, solenoid wiring that's out of the spare transmission that we, that we got. So I'll checked all the electrical connections are all in good condition and using the few wiring diagrams that I've got I double checked and triple checked to make sure that it's compatible that the wiring from this transmission is compatible with ours so that we don't put it in and have any nasty surprises. Uh, I've got to try and make it easier for myself to thread the needle to get all of this stuff back in so by Putting some electrical tape around this um, should help help me sneak it through because I've got a really tight gap to pass through. I'd love to be able to take undo these nuts, pull the connector out, and thread it through the reverse direction. But there's a passage that's about this wide that it's all got to, to, to fit through, so it's just not going to work. Even though you can't even really take the connector apart properly to do it. Steve will use these wires to help pull the head of the Medusa through.
before we start on threading the wires back in, I've still got one more solenoid to fit and uh, in, into the transmission. As you recall, we've got two that were suspect, one that had failed completely. I've already replaced the two suspect ones, so now it's time to get the uh, third and last one in there. This one's a little bit complicated because if you look at the bottom of the solenoid, there's a, a pin in here, which is connected to a, a strip of metal which runs inside the transmission for the emergency gear shift override. And because it locks into there, you can't pull the thing out unless the solenoid is uh, energized. So I had a lot of trouble getting this one out, but hopefully I should be able to get it in a bit easier because I'm gonna put some power to it and you'll be able to see the solenoid click into place. That's, that's energized, that's off. So when you energize it, what is that doing to this solenoid unit? What, well, what does that cause the vehicle to do? When the solenoid is on, it directs the oil flow from one path to another, and it's actually locking the torque converter up. So the torque converter is used there to help save fuel. So if you're not driving the tank through challenging terrain, you've got the torque converter locked up so that you don't have the slippage in the transmission system, reduces heat buildup and saves on fuel. And it's part of the emergency override as well too. So when you select the override, it it locks the transmission in forward, second gear with the torque converter locked up. All right, so I'm gonna put the solenoid in place, then I'll put a fuse in there so it energizes it, and then I'll start the process of trying to wriggle it into the selector mechanism. Without shorting it out. Without shorting it out. Okay, heard it go click. Yep. I think I got it. In like Flynn. <laughs> In like Flynn, sorry. It takes a while, but after Steve finally fitted the last solenoid, now he could try and get all the wires through this tiny passage in the transmission. This one's slightly longer, so I'll start with that. Also, what I have to do is, um, again, this emergency override linkage gets in the way and it reduces down the size of it. So I worked out that um, I can clamp a pair of vice grips onto the linkage. So it locks the lever up to give us what little room is there. Once I get the first bit through, then life should be easier. It's a boy! <laughs> Just a minute, you start to grab an individual wire, you end up breaking the thing off. Exactly what we don't need right we now. We don't need that, no. Here we go, it's coming. Hey. hey. Done. Job Here done. At long last, he prevails. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the wires are finally through, but how on earth did Steve figure out what they're all connected to? I'd love to be able to get a Haynes manual uh, for the Leopard to tell me exactly what the bits are. Instead, what, what I have to do is go looking off the internet, and I was really fortunate to be able to find, actually care of the Brazilian armed forces, uh, a copy of a Leopard manual in Portuguese, which I then ran through a translating program to sort of give me a few um, hints on what the different circuits are. This component here is the shifter assembly and each one of the terminals is coded with a letter and you've also got a separate number for the actual circuit. Say if I want to find out what first gear is, right? So 
I have a look at first gear that's terminal B. The identification or circuit number is 281. And then very helpfully, on the ID plate showing that the actual components under this cover, you can see that first gear is circuit 281. So that's then how I can work out which pin on the plug goes to which component inside the transmission so that when I'm hooking it all back together again and testing it, that it's in the right order. So yeah, con congratulations to the um, valued viewer that um, actually picked that there were two missing screws from this uh, plate which belongs to the Leopard's transmission. So I don't know what happened to the two screws. I'm gonna kick this into the long grass and worry about this later, but I've got myself some, some screws. I'll put some Loctite on it, <laughs> stick it in and make sure the others are tight and <laughs> she'll be sweet. Nice. After just a few hours, all of the wires were hooked up. But just to be sure, they have to be tested. So what I wanna do now is actually put 24 volts through it, which is the operating voltage, and test that not only is the component working, but also the amount of current that it's drawing. So on my little lookup sheet, reverse is terminal G, which is this one here. So you hear the solenoid click? On, off, on. So the other thing that I'm looking for as well is the amount of current that the component is drawing. You can see here it's 0.74 of an amp, which is good. So what we want to make sure is that all of these components are all drawing about the same amount of current, because then we know that they're all in good condition and that everything's working ticky boo. Big surprise, he plugged it all in, tested it and got it right. Yeah, we've, we've, we've closed it up and the, the transmission and I have had a few words and I've sort of said, don't take any offence, but I hope we never ever see each other again. Now to cover it all up with the radiator. What's the process for refitting this radiator? I'm trying to think because I haven't, <laughs> I didn't actually pull it apart. The, the radiators are held on by these mounting clamps and the clamps slot into the housing and are tensioned by these threads here so that you've got the right amount of tension on the radiator because you don't need a huge amount of tension, just enough to hold it in place. So there's a whole bunch of these straps which go around the outside. So I'm just getting ready so that when we lift it up with the forklift, it goes on nice and square. We can put these on, tighten them down, and then we start on fitting the radiator hoses. Yep. Then we refill the cooling system, which I think is about 100 litres of uh, fluid needs to go in. And I've made up a sort of a test rig so that we can put some pressure on the cooling system to do a leak test. We only want to put it in once. That's right. That's it. <laughs> it's easy because there's some pipes on the bottom so that when it pivots that it doesn't, doesn't hit the pipes. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for that confidence. It's very encouraging. A of confidence. These things line up, line yeah. up in with them and go into here, but we've got to screw them in with a spanner. Oh, I see. It's freaky, isn't it? So you there's, might be able to so there's no way you can start it by hand. You can't. You can't start it and then slip this in after, or no? Could probably screw it in like this. That's a good idea. Goes onto it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, 
Three blokes, one transmission. Less orangutan. Yeah. Is that spinning or not? Do you want it cross threaded? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Alright, good idea. Uh, but I'll put the rest of the clips yeah. on before we yeah. put some more into that. These were really fiddly. There's almost certainly a logical and easy way of putting them on, and it was almost certainly the way we didn't use, but we got there in the end. The radiator is fitted and ready for its pressure test the following day, the final step before we can get this leopard back into running condition. Steve does a final once over of all the joins and hoses before bucketing the dozens of litres of coolant into the radiator system. It's like a novelty spanner. <clears throat> radiator cap. I'm guessing this is like a bleed point to get air out of the system. So with 100 litres of liquid that's got to fill up the engine block, it's got to fill up the radiators, it's got to fill up the header tank and all the plumbing, there's going to be a lot of air to get out of it. So. What they've put here is like a bleeder, so it's at the high point of the cooling system, so that it helps drain the air out of the system when it comes to filling it up. So I've got to mix this one bucket concentrate to two buckets of water. Get to see any water in here yet. Oh. That should even it up a bit. Well, we've probably got as much water as it's going to take, but now what I'm going to do is put some compressed air into the cooling system and I'll monitor the pressure that I'm putting in so that we can put the uh, system under some pressure to check the leaks and it should also help stabilise the level of water in the engine. Pretty standard re air regulator, but I think if we put about four or five psi of uh, air pressure in there, that should be enough to simulate it operating. So we've got water pump. So this this is driven off the back of the supercharger. So the water pump draws coolant out of the engine block and circulates it through the system. Radiator fittings. Radiator drain, pipe fittings, coolant hoses. Yeah, she's looking sweet. After a thorough check with the system under pressure, there are no leaks to be found. Nothing else for it but to drop the beast in.
very happy Leopard engine. We're almost there. What a bloody beauty, that's good. We did it. Well, that was a stressful sort of 10, 15 minutes of my life, so I'm happy that's over. <laughs> Tune in next Wednesday for your weekly tank restoration fix. So until then, I'm Kurt from Oz Armour. I'll see you on the next one. And welcome to Workshop Wednesday. <laughs> it's just so silly.